or put grandma's bookmark in there that she gave me for your birthday. Put that in there. And then also go across to John the 8th chapter. John chapter 8. If you are one of the guys that's using the new technology and you have the Bible on your cell phone, then I'd like for you to go there. John chapter 8 and Matthew chapter 11. Before I put the, the PowerPoint up, because I don't want to give it away, we know that in this life, there are things that the world says and does that programs us. And that's just the way it is. That's the way this life is. It programs us according to its system. And when you become a Christian, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have to start renewing your mind according to the things of God and by the Word of God in order to adopt a new way of thinking. And I want to give you just a couple of sayings to ask you to complete them for me. There's a thing that is going around nowadays that a lot of people are saying. They're saying, it is, come on, come on, it is, let's say it, what it is. It is what it is. And listen to me, that wasn't around 10 years ago. It just wasn't here. It's just coming recently. It is what it is. Who can tell me another one that is used very, very frequently in our daily language, in our daily vernacular? Who can tell me another one? That, thank you. Thank you, Nikita. That's life. Amen. Exactly that. Come on, that's a good one from Nikita. Another one from our... That's just for why the cookie crumbles. Thank you. <laughs> Shane, that, that one's like on the button. That's just the way the cookie crumbles. These are the things that we say. These are the things we talk about. And then there's one that I want to talk about this morning, but I've swung it around. And we, we usually say, life has its ups and downs. I knew you would know that one very, very well, because we use it very, very frequently. So what I'm going to do this morning is, I'm going to swing it around, and I'm going to ask Pastor Joe to put that on for us. And we are going to say this morning that life has its downs and ups. You say to me, that's typically you. You always mess with things. <laughs> I do. I really do. I mess things of this world up completely. And there's a good reason for it. Because we are Christians. We are not of this world. We are of God. And we do things differently. We are not the same as this world. We are different. And I hope by now you have found Matthew chapter 11. And we're going to read... Two verses from there. And I'm not going to go into the whole chapter before because the, the two verses here in the middle of the chapter really basically puts it all together for us. In verse 18, Jesus is speaking. How do we know that? Well, it's in red. Well, that's the cop out. That's the easy way. We just know Jesus is speaking. All right? This is what he's saying in Matthew. He says, For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man, and now Jesus is referring to Himself, came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a gluttonous man and a wine bibber, or then a wine drinker, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And in my Bible, there's an exclamation mark. So if Jesus uh, puts an exclamation mark in the Bible, we know that it's there for a reason. That's the way He said it. But wisdom, he says, is justified by her children. So yeah, look, look, at, look at what Jesus is saying. He says, John didn't come eating and drinking, and they say he's got a demon. I'm sitting with some sinners, and I'm eating and drinking, and they say to me, you are a glutton and you're a wine bibber. Here's the thing. I believe that Jesus sitting at this table with us, let's call them for now, to bring effect into the story, a bunch of sinners. He's sitting with a bunch of sinners. And they are calling him, of course, who is calling him this? Who are they? The 
Pharisees. You are a wine bibber and you are a glutton. I think in order for them to say that, Jesus must have dug in. Come on now. Because he didn't correct them and say, listen guys, I didn't actually have that much. He didn't say that. You know, I just had like a couple of grapes. I mean, two lamb shakes. I mean, you know, really. You know what I'm saying? It's really not that bad. You guys are making a big thing of this. He says, John didn't do that. You call him one who has a demon. And you call me a wine bibber. And you call me a glutton. Now, how many of you have ever been called anything by people in this world? From a young age. Isn't it true that people classify us and say things about us by the way we look or something that we do from a young age? And how many of you know that those names, a lot of them stick until we are into adulthood? And then when people see you when you are now an adult and you are an astute gentleman or a very sophisticated lady, they still remember that and they still say, oh yeah, you are, and they'll call you by the nickname because they can't remember your real name. And I look at that and I see that the Bible is full of it. And I want to mention just a few. Moses stuttered. David was an over fighter. You go read the life of David. You'll find this boy king was a fighter. I think he had small man syndrome. And he always wanted to prove himself. Because he wasn't of big stature, the Bible says. He was a handsome guy. And I suppose he always wanted to protect his face. So he always hit first. <laughs> I don't know what David's problem was, but he was an overfighter. He couldn't even build the house of God because the Bible says that his hands was full of blood. John Mark deserted Paul. Timothy had ulcers. He had stomach problems. Hosea's wife was a prostitute. Amos' only training was in the school of fig tree pruning. Jacob was a liar and a chancer. David had an affair and he murdered the woman's husband. How's this list so far? <coughs> Imagine the names they carried. Come on now. Solomon was too rich. Abraham was too old. David was too young. There's a couple of ones with David here. You'll see it. Peter was afraid of death. Lazarus was dead. <laughs> and Jesus used him. First they had to resurrect him, but come on guys, let's you know what? Yes, I have this incredible vivid imagination of things. Come on now. Headlines in the Jerusalem Post the next day. After Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Huh? And you walk into Willie's and you're standing in the queue and you look across the aisle. And there's Lazarus. What are you going to say to people that are with you in the queue? That's the oak that was dead and is now alive. That, that's him over there, Lazarus. Huh? There was a testimony of the goodness and the greatness of Jesus. John was self-righteous. Naomi was a widow. Paul was the persecutor of the church. Moses was a murderer. Jonah ran from God's wall. And he had a lot of complaints about it as well. Miriam was a gossip. Gideon and Thomas both doubted. Jeremiah was depressed and suicidal. Elijah was burnt out and suicidal. Martha was a worry wart. <laughs> did we mention that Moses had a short fuse? Had a temper problem? So did Peter and Paul. And well, lots of them did when you go read the Bible. That's why you've heard me say this. The Bible is not a book about good people. It's a good book about people. Always remember that. God doesn't require a job interview and a good CV to interview you for acceptance. Amen. He doesn't look at your financial gain or loss. He doesn't look at the messes of your past. He knows who we are, what we are, what we've done, and He loves us in spite of ourselves. Amen. Thank goodness, indeed. Thank Him for what He's done. Now, have you found John the 8th chapter? Let us go over to John and the 8th chapter. John chapter 8. From the first verse. And this is one of those stories in the Bible that I know 
is going to bless you because of the fact that it's going to encourage you and lift you for where you are in your own personal life. And by the way, when they call Jesus a friend of sinners, and you've heard me say this, and I want to repeat it for those who haven't heard it. When they call Jesus a friend of sinners, He wore it as a badge of honor. He did not see it as an insult. Why? Because He said, the Son of Man did not come for those who are sick, excuse me, for those who are well, but for those who are sick. He is the physician of the sick. In John chapter 8, we have another story, which you also know quite well from verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and but early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came to him, and he sat down, and he taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. I just want to say to you, the original Greek text says, we found this woman in the act of adultery. We're going to get to this just now. Again. I hope I'll be able to expound it for you today by the Holy Spirit in maybe a way you haven't seen it before. Now Moses, in the law, commanded that someone like this should be stoned. And here comes the trick question. But what do you say? Scoundrels. You know, they always had something up their sleeve. This they said, testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down. Say with me, stooped down. Stooped down. And wrote on the ground with his finger. So when they continued asking him, they are persistent. Listen to me. Accusers are always persistent. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who was out, is without sin among you, let him throw the first stone at her. And again he stooped down, and he wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up, he said to her, Woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. By the way, when you read verse 11 and you go study that in the original text, you go to the root there, you'll find that Jesus said to her, don't sin any more of the same kind. So don't go back into what you did before. Why? Because now I'm in your life. I'll take care of you from here on. Come on now. Let's picture the story. Can I ask you just to close those blinds because there's a car's window reflecting right into my face here. Thanks, Matthew. Thank you. Thanks. Let's look at the story here. What happened here? Here's this woman. Jesus is going about his business. And they bring this woman and said they have found her. It's like they stumbled across her in the very act of adultery. Now I want to ask you, really. They knew exactly where to find her. This whole thing was a setup. They, if, if we read what it says then, what they said to Jesus, it's like they were walking down the street, being the best little Pharisees they know how to be, not bothering anybody, and oops, they stumble over adultery. <laughs> that's the commentator, that's what they're saying. Like, that's what I'm saying. Really? Like, guys? Like, you're dealing with Jesus here. You're not dealing with somebody who doesn't know what this whole thing is all about. And then they said, we have, we've caught this woman in the very act of adultery. 
I'm going to go there. And I'm not even going to ask you. I believe they were a bunch of peeping Toms. And think about it. They bashed in there and grabbed this woman. Listen to me. They didn't say to her, let us put something over you. Let us, let, us, let us dress you first. Let us take care of you. Let us make you more presentable. And then we'll take you out. Can you see what these guys did? You see, that's what an accuser does. An accuser wants to not only strip you naked, but keep you naked and accuse you before everybody. An accuser wants to expose you. A accusers exposes people. And they put her in front of Jesus. I think they just slammed her down in the dust. And then they come up with the law. Not knowing and realizing that he who said, I have come to fulfill the law, is standing right in their midst. Now I want to say something to you. Something interesting that it's, this is just a little off ramp just to stop for fuel. Okay? Just off the highway for now. So you don't have to pay anything for this, what I'm going to say to you right now. It's free of charge. This one. Okay. Get this. When God gave the law to Moses, what happened to the first two tablets? Huh? They broke. I want you to see the connotation here. The law was broken even before we got it. <laughs> Hallelujah! And then the second time, man and God was involved in bringing it across as the law. So here's Jesus standing in the midst of this woman. He who is liberty. He who is freedom in himself. And he, he listens to the accusation. And instead of answering, he could have answered. Jesus had much to say at that particular point in time. He could have given it to them. How did Jesus usually deal with situations? When, when they come with that accusation that this is what the law says, what do you say? What did they want to prove? What did they want him to say? Yes, I substantiate the law. <coughs> if he was the substantiator of the law, he was not the liberator of the same. Yes. And now what happens when I have heard theologians and scholars and I've read the commentaries about this particular thing where Jesus stoops down to write in the sand, in the soil. But I want you to see what happens here where I think a lot of us perhaps just missed it. He stoops down. The very first thing he does is not for the purpose of writing in the sand. The very first thing that he does is not to write in the sand, but to get down to the woman's level. So we, in life, talk about we have ups and downs. But I want to say to you, in God's kingdom, we have downs and ups. Because Jesus came down. Jesus was in heaven's glory. Remember, this is the thing that we must remember. For unto us a child is born. It says in Isaiah chapter 9. But, Pastor Joe, the son is given. The son was never born. He always was. It was the child who was born. The son was in the child. He always was. He came down from heaven's glory, from the splendor of majesty. Think about that. Seated at the right hand of the father. And the father turned to him and said, Son, it's time to go. And he was transferred from the right hand of the father into a baby. I had a picture in my Bible right in the front and it, it was just so old that eventually it just came loose and it fell out some way. I, I haven't found it since. If, by the way, this is a bit of a hint. You know, the Bible says, faith without hints is dead. So uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to ask you as a congregation to help me look for one. But I had a picture where it was Jesus in the manger laying in the crib with a mature Jesus standing next to him with his hand over him. And that just depicts the whole thing because as it was the two of them. Two being one, you know what I'm saying there? 
So Jesus stoops down to this woman. In front of everybody, he goes down because now he is with this woman on the same level. And he starts writing in the sand. And I don't know what you've heard, but I've heard many things. I've, I've heard people say, well, you see, Pastor Ewan, what happened was Jesus wrote the names of the people who also utilized his services in the sand, who were standing around, who were the accusers. That's what he did. He wrote the names down of those Pharisees. Why is that not true? It's not written in the Bible. Hmm? It's not in the Bible. Listen to this. The reason Jesus never wrote their names is because... I think I'll carry on with this next Sunday. How's this coming? Yeah. Yeah. All right. The reason why Jesus didn't write their names in the soil... Because then he himself would have become an accuser just like them. Then he would have accused them. Do you see it? 